It's been roughly 20 years now since the release of Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later, and in that time, apparently everybody seemed to forget what makes zombie media good. I see ads for The Walking Dead still, and that show started back in 2010. They're making more spin-off series than the property has any right to have, and I guess that's just because people can't get enough of that sweet, sweet zombie kill in action. At least, that's all I can assume the show covers at this point. I haven't actually seen The Walking Dead, but what exactly could a series spanning 13 years offer other than shallow violence and mean-spirited writing, the kind of creation which seems so prevalent in the mainstream of television? And it's not just zombie movies or television which have been subjected to this fate, it's all horror, really. A good number of movies which I quite enjoy could easily fall under the genre, yet it's embarrassing to self-identify as a horror fan, given the sort of stigma which reeks from that corner of fandom. People who legitimately enjoy Friday the 13th for all of its offerings are not necessarily the type of crowd which I'd fall into willingly. Someone who enjoys those moments in Day of the Dead, the scenes in which an arm gets chopped off or in which a man's head is ripped from his body, more than the takeaway morals or a satisfying conclusion, are surely part of the problem. Well-executed special effects are commendable, and they can certainly take a film a step above. But Day of the Dead is by far and away a better film than Friday the 13th, and it's not because of superior makeup work or gore effects. I'm gonna tell you what it is. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you what it is. You ain't never gonna figure it out. Just like they never figured out why the stars are where they're at. It ain't mankind's job to figure that stuff out. So what you're doing is a waste of time, Sarah. And time is all we got left, you know. 28 Days Later has been credited as a major influence for the reinvigoration of the zombie genre into the 21st century. Scary is what it is known as, and surely that sticks. The fast-moving infected who always seem to come at the worst time are frightening. Suspense drips from many corners of the film. The idea that all which stands between you and them is a single drop of blood drives a unique kind of fear. All of the horror elements are here in spades, and that's certainly what it is remembered as being. Horror. And yet, I find myself drawn to it for very different reasons. I like the hope. I like that it's not the false kind, the sugar-coated, glossy optimism of contemporary Hollywood, that it's a hope which proves its worth by persisting in the worst of times. 28 Days Later is great for the same reason that Day of the Dead is great, because it's a horror movie, a zombie movie, which proposes that the end of times, what seems to be the end of the road, a turn to new and worse beginnings, does not have to be, so long as we choose something else, something better. Each film seems to suppose that our road to brighter sands and greener pastures is one which relies on our taking the necessary leap. Whether leaving something bad behind or forging a future which is better, perhaps Day of the Dead, and certainly 28 Days Later, asserts that the fantasy, the dream life, is in your hands. Twenty Eight Days Later is a film which certainly speaks to the younger male demographic, who are perhaps only now coming into their own. The film commentates on many fronts of the youthful male struggle, through its main character Jim. Presumably in his 20s, Jim is a compelling representation of nervous youth without direction, which eventually blossoms into a manhood with foundation, something to fight for. But he must start somewhere. Nervous, unsure, and without guidance, Jim starts his journey as, for all practical purposes, a child. Jim's awakening in a hospital bed to a once understood but now strange and unfamiliar world places him in a uniquely vulnerable state for a protagonist. He's like an infant, greeting a world which he does not yet get. As if born again, Jim examines a dilapidated London, abandoned and lost. He stumbles around without a place to be, without people to be with. Who is he? It's not hard to see the strange parallels between the film and our current timeline. The events of 2020 onward seem to have imitated the epidemic destruction of 28 Days Later, if not quite as extreme in its repercussions. 
The aftermath of the pandemic was not total evacuation of the states, but for a time the world did seem emptier. Still not empty, however. That all has seemed to subside though, things are mostly back to normal. Whatever that looks like anymore. The new normal is what post-2020 is being called. What that looks like isn't mass evacuations, nor flesh-hungry beasts ravaging the empty streets, nor average people scavenging for unopened Pepsis, but people increasingly staying home. Home all the time. Maybe it's weird to think about, but it wasn't always so that people stayed in all week, exclusively ordered food on delivery apps, worked from home, subscribed to 10 different streaming services, socialized only on YouTube and Twitch, and yet isn't that what people do? Many of them at least? Some people aren't even entirely aware of it. I know the feeling. I've seen and heard comment after comment on how the last three years of existence has felt like a black hole, time lost without accounting for any of the days. It's a little scary to consider just how fast the powers above can totally shift everything. The way average citizens' lives can be totally uprooted, changed drastically, practically overnight. I didn't keep track exactly, but it wouldn't be far off to say that, in 2020, the world was completely changed in the short span of 28 days. The notion of so much changing in just 28 days really taps into the idea of lost time and the defeating mindset that all things are simply worse now and there's nothing you can do about it. Jim's frightful beginnings speak to the fears of an upcoming generation, young men who feel lost, forgotten, and afraid, weak and helpless just as Jim is. Growing up is a hard thing. It is to be cast off into a new and potentially unfriendly world, and it is especially hard to do when the newfound pressures from all around make staying put all too appealing. The comments of lost time, the sentiments shared by many that each year after 2020 has felt like a day, that time is moving faster than anyone can keep up with, all stem from this inability to grow up, to take ownership and accountability of our own lives, to make the days ours. Who could be blamed for not doing any of that though? After all, the incentives are all found at home. If there's a word for Jim at the outset of 28 Days Later, it's uninitiated. For most of the film, Jim plays a passive role. He is nearly eaten, saved only by the grace of experienced survivors, and, from then on, he continues to be treated by those who are more capable. Jim, once the son in a preordained family, finds himself conveniently in the graces of a new one, out of the frying pan and into another. The young Jim, who practically stands for uninitiated male fear, just the same stands for uninitiated male comfort. The uninitiated male is dependent on someone and does not have to be afraid of being left behind, for he will be accounted for into the foreseeable future. The uninitiated male will be supplied and will be looked after. He has never been, and likely won't ever be, subjected to the fire. He is convinced in one way or another, whether by someone or something, that to forge his own path would be unnecessary, as a path will already have been made in his way. If there's a word for post-2020 men, it's uninitiated. I spent a lot of time playing games in the first few years of this new normal. Lots of good ones. It was in the fall of 2020 that I first played a trio of games, which I still look back on as some of my favorites today. My free time was filled with the engrossing worlds of such titles as Resident Evil, Bioshock, and Fallout New Vegas. I love Fallout. I consider New Vegas one of my favorite games of all time. Fallout 3 was incredibly easy for me to sink hours and hours into my first go around about a year and a half ago, and I've even put around 100 hours into Fallout 4. A considerable chunk of my time has been spent in those worlds, although I've loved Fallout since before I even touched one of the video games. My adoration was formed years and years back, before ever opening, let alone purchasing, a Fallout game, and if there's any reason why, it was because of the tone. Discovering Galaxy News Radio was huge for me as a kid. The tone was instant goosebumps. The idea fascinated me. A post-nuclear wasteland, all of Americana shredded and torn. The nation of fallen giant in disarray. 
all whilst old Bob Crosby tunes played against it in the background. It was genius, it was art. It was the juxtaposition between the most heinous and abominable timeline the world could ever know, with perhaps the single greatest slice of civilization anyone had ever known, which chilled me. To create a game concerning the gutting of a nation to desolate emptiness, and then form a fictional radio station, which played the fullest and the most soulful charm of a deceased paradise, was more than brilliant in my mind. On the one hand, anyone unfamiliar with Fallout may call it dark, and maybe they'd be right, but it's not the fact that Fallout is dark that gets me to play it. It's that in its grim themes, in its overwhelming darkness, it elevates the soul of every little thing which is worthwhile. Послушайте. I see no reason for the popularity of games like Fallout or Stalker more compelling than the fact that they fulfill the global search for soul. In a world fashioned by fakeness and a glossy, insincere coat over everything being made, where everything is not okay, yet media, news, and entertainment will either point your attention the wrong way, or flat out say that there's nothing wrong, where depression and anxiety is swept away with fleeting cures, where all that seems to matter anymore is the surface level, there's nothing unnatural about the desire for a place where none of that exists. A place where very little exists, in fact. What is to be found in these digital worlds are the remnants of society, and the heart of it, maybe. The funny part about games set against disaster is that the vital organs of the civilization aren't ever really lost. Sure, the politics are gone, the gears of advertising, the banking system, the industrial output of food, everything which fluffs up a national image and makes a country seem prosperous is dissolved. But what's left is all that ever really mattered anyways. All the shit. It doesn't really mean anything to Frank and Hannah because well, she's got a dad and he's got his daughter, so. Cheeky monkey. I was wrong when I said that staying alive is as good as it gets. 28 Days Later has this stretch in the middle, which is oddly optimistic. When initial hurdles are jumped, characters established, and a thrown together family formed, the film truly does subvert with its upbeat demeanor. Jim, after having been around with Selena, Frank, and Hannah, and after having made a hair of the neck escape, has essentially found his place to be. They're a family, cracking jokes, raiding supermarkets, having picnics. For a time, Apocalypse is just what anyone would hope for it to be, and how could Jim be any better off? He has a girlfriend in Selena, a sister in Hannah, and a father in Frank. With them, Jim can fit in exactly how he would have if only disaster had never hit. For just long enough, it's as though the outbreak had never broken out at all, because everything which mattered now and had ever mattered was still there. If a makeshift family could be pulled together in this kind of climate, then maybe there wasn't anything to be afraid of anymore. In fact, at this point, the only fear plaguing Jim isn't that of being infected or killed, but of losing this new family. It's idyllic, really. It's truly everything a guy could hope for and dream of. It's just about the greatest possible scenario for a post-disaster world. What I and others play Fallout or Stalker to find in occasional crumbs and pieces exists so brightly here and 28 days later for this short little stretch, and it's wonderful. It's so nice, and it's so strangely vibrant, so joyfully ignorant to everything else around it, and it only makes sense that it has to end, as all good things do. Of course, 28 Days Later shatters the fantasy and rejects the complacent happily ever after, which would ask nothing of Jim and request no growth. Perhaps the most crucial scene of the film is the sudden and solemn death of Frank, who gets infected by a stray drop of blood and is shortly thereafter gunned down by a squad of ex-military men, a sequence not unheard of in other zombie media, yet one which hits differently here. With Frank's death comes the death of fatherhood, spelling for Jim the end of youth, the end of an easy family for him to tag along in. 
If Jim, the only boy in the surrogate family, was once the son, what then does he become when the father dies? The end of the family saga brings about new and unsure chapters, and where there was once a warm safety and security under Frank's gentle authority, there was a cold sharpness and unpredictability in regards to the military group. With the arrival of this callous band valuing survival above all else, the ugly head of danger rears again, and Jim's free ride officially ends. In this way, 28 Days Later is a strong-handed address of the fantasy, the dream that some would have of living in a world like that of the film, or like that of Fallout or Stalker, of finding in it a soul and a belonging that perhaps eludes them in their daily life here. The hope is that, in being mercilessly stripped of its makeup and its facade of happiness, with nothing more to distract and nothing more to make vapid, suffocating noise, all that can logically be left in the rubble of the world is the soul. Finding people who make you happy, sensing joy in the little things, living to live, not only to survive, these might all be easier to obtain in a different world, a harsher world. In my mind, this is the core philosophy driving the beliefs of self-proclaimed accelerationists, those who chant that if things are to ever go down, they might as well do so sooner rather than later. And of course, those who haven't quite gotten ahead in our day, who haven't partaken in life as their peers have, who haven't climbed very far on the ladder, would be quick to wish that it all were reset. Those who haven't thrived under the systems of our world would, naturally, wish to be in another. And it's one thing to merely predict the downfall of a government or a system, to deem a collapse inevitable. But that's not what accelerationism is about, is it? It's not just a prediction or a passive forecast, but buried underneath is a hope and an eagerness to get on with it already as though things will magically be better once it has gotten on with. Time, time, time. Ah, this time enough at last. The wish for society to hurry up already and crash like it's supposed to might be partially fueled by the desire to be right and have their off-the-chart politics confirmed and validated. Maybe it is all an ego game to have their unique predictions, the ones which mainstream media won't tell you, vindicated. But at its heart, it may just be entitlement, laziness. The idea that the reason why you haven't made it far in our world is because it's rigged against you, and because it was never made to last, and because it's crashing and will soon have crashed. The idea that everything you never had but deserved will come your way once it all comes tumbling down. This poisonous mindset, the self-assured line of thinking that you'll get what's yours eventually. It is a kind of textbook entitlement, to be in many rights uninitiated, maybe because of a lack of self-drive or motivation, yet to cling on for hope in the fantasy of a ruined land where you are brought to even level with everyone else instantly. That's the hope, the sordid desire, that in everything tumbling, the world will bend to your needs rather than you bending to the world. With the gears brought to a screeching halt, maybe, as the games would tell us, soul would prevail, and ideal living would be there for the taking. Disaster-driven media appeals not only because it showcases a beautiful display of soul, which even we in a functioning society do not always receive, but because the soul it offers is one which we can enjoy passively, just as Jim does for a time. Only for a time, however. The final act of 28 Days Later is the film's strongest counterpoint against the fantasy. With the death of Frank, Jim's new family threatened by the lustful military cadre, and nobody else to save them, Jim is faced with his first real struggle in the film. Up to this point, his path has been a passive one, his meals have come from elsewhere, his strength from elsewhere too. But now, Jim faces the impending separation of himself from those who he's learned to care for, and now it's time to prove his love. Just when everything seemed to fall into place as anyone would hope for, the call of duty arrived, pale-faced and mad. Those who would wish to find distilled soul in a cracking world may forget that the soul comes later, survival comes first. 
Struggle will come in one world just as it comes in another, and Jim, like us all, cannot escape it should he hope to preserve anything worthwhile. Jim's rampage at the climax, if a bit brutal or savage, is a perfectly and immensely satisfying completion of the fatherhood arc. The man who once started as a scared child in the dark, lost, wandering, and alone, becomes a part of something special, a family he is not just a passive player in, but learns is worth fighting for, and in order to keep together must be fought for. It is truly in this ending that the cause for fantasy can be found. In a fake world without real feeling or attachment, many young men may wish they were Jim, living in a place stripped of its glossy coat and finding only the soulful things left. But what is never considered is that, like Jim, they would need to fight and struggle greatly for that soul, and even if it came for free, it could really only last so long until the bill came due. I suppose 28 Days Later's biggest contribution then is its demolition of the fantasy, at once capturing it beautifully, an idyllic portrait of family in the midst of disaster, only to then crush it in the next instant. Simply put, the dream is not fulfilled passively, and if it is, then it's only temporary, and the bridge goes out eventually. What men will find is more worthy than any notion of pre-made perfection or convenient happiness is the discovery of something to care about and someone to protect, the things that ask of you a commitment. And luckily, you don't need a zombie-infested Armageddon, nor the waste-laid ruins of war, to find such a cause or such a person. In all honesty, if you can't manage it right here and right now, then you won't manage it even in the event of either. Struggle is found in one world as it is found in another. No fantasy scenario can guarantee good things without a fight. A movie's ending is crucial, because it alone holds the power to totally reshape or cement the broader themes of the entire piece. A good ending can be legendary. I don't understand the prevalence nor the popularity of never-ending television shows for this very reason. How can you be satisfied knowing that there is no ending, no real conclusion, no theme? Any amount of fiction writing I've done in my free time has been driven by either the spark of an idea or an ending in mind. Nothing can motivate quite like the knowledge of a really good resolution on the horizon, the meaning, the weight, and the power which a story builds up to. That's what gets me to write at all. This translates well to real life, because is an ending not what we're all working for and striving towards every day? Why wake up? Why move? Why work? If not for the sake of bringing that perfect ending which we all envision just a little bit closer to reality, a story and a life mean nothing if not for the ending. And just so, an ending means nothing without a beginning and a middle. There is no relief without the struggle, no good without the bad. It is unfortunate that we don't quite get to choose our beginnings, and as the last few years have shown, we can't always have absolute control over our middles either as neither do many of fiction's greatest protagonists. But what is, at the end of the day, within our control, totally, is the ending. 28 Days Later blew me away because of its ending. Well, there are a few other standout moments, but the ending hooked into me most. And it's not that other movies haven't done this, had a protagonist who starts off weak only to persevere and build for himself something so worthwhile in the end but it was the unmistakable tone of it that I couldn't shake. This film, like Blade Runner 2049, was made for a contemporary audience. Only it was actually released two decades before COVID or TikTok or any of the other plagues infesting modern society ever came to be. And yet, if it had come out three years ago, it would have been so at home. 28 Days Later had a resurgence during the pandemic, apparently, and it's not hard to see why. When the world seemed to change so drastically, when everything people had become dependent on, the systems with which we moved, shifted overnight, everyone searched for a haven. For me, it was Fallout. For others, it was Stalker. And those watching perhaps chose 28 Days Later. And while these choices were all admittedly made with escape in mind, 28 Days Later ridicules the escape. I think some people harbor a partial resentment for the fact that they live in this world, a world which they do not enjoy, which they did not choose, and would almost wish to take it to the next level, to the end, in a roundabout way of starting over again. 
Out of an anger, out of a spite, and out of some hidden want down deep in their saddened, rotting core, they think that since things are already as bad as they are, that they might as well get worse, brought kneeling to a point where there's nowhere to go but up. They would like that, because it is an ending which is chosen for them. There is no agency in that. That good things will come to you effortlessly is the hope and the fault. What else is there to say about 28 Days Later, other than its poignant messaging? Sure, there is the memorable depiction of the zombies, the terrible circumstance which turned everyone's head when it just about came true, but all of it amounts to naught without the end. I think he saw us this time. <laughs> Purposeless middling without end appears to be the modus operandi of the current climate, an economy built on the dollars of self-worshipping consumers, subsisting on the effortless handouts of a shameless ruling order. I think the aforementioned immortality of The Walking Dead is a pretty fitting microcosm for the state of civilized society. Everything around you seems to only offer new ways to look nicer, and to live longer, all of it only so that you may turn in the next instance and spend those extra years on something which doesn't matter. Recreation which, like you, is so desperately maintained and prolonged, just because. Their only motivation in keeping you until a hundred is so that there will still be an audience left for their slop as it comes. To make you forget that there is an end, that there is a transcendence to reach in our short time here, is the goal of the puppeteering hands. Given life right now, I can't outright state to not understand or relate at all to anyone who would claim enlightenment in their prediction or desire for all of it to go south. But this is not enlightenment, laziness rather, a cheap way out under the guise of political knowledge. Things, despite what anyone will tell you, are not entirely better than they were a hundred years ago. Progress is, apparently, not so. Yet the question after rough times, harsh years, and worse beginnings should not be, how could it get worse, or when will it end, but rather, what can I make of it? Admittedly, a lot of decisions are made for us, but how you end up? Well, they can only have so much control over that. Don't give it away.